And we are live. Hello, my name is Eugene. This is Bolshevik Bistro. This is actually the second attempt of us trying to live stream because um, I overestimated the capabilities of my machine. So we have to go back to Google Hangouts, which we all love and hate at the same time. But I'm here with Elliot Rosenstock. Hello, Elliot. How's it going? Hi. Well, you know what's interesting is that we had an we have an interesting negotiation process going where mm -hmm. we did like 30 minutes of of interview already and I said it we can't 15. start over. Oh 15, sorry. <laughs> and then I was like, we can't start over. And you said we won't be starting over. And now we won't we are. because we were not, not but, going to be <laughs> But I feel like yeah. even if we were starting over at this point in the dis in the in the discourse, I'm fine with starting over. Here we are talking. <laughs> well so, let's so, do but, that. But let's that was do all that necessary. That was all let's necessary. Do that briefly. Yeah, 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 the whole yeah. process was necessary. It's like, it reminds me of Hegel uh, when he basically says that, you know, it's like every single thing should be done basically twice because first time you will fail 100% and then the second time if you persevere, that will basically be the indicator of success. Yeah, uh, exactly. And like that, we, we're going Hegelian on here. Look at us. I mean, he the problem with Hegel is he's right. So it's like, you can be anti-Hegelian, but you'll be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the trouble you'll have. Like Hegel wasn't trying to like put forth a metaphysical, I guess, like system. He was trying to like, he was really trying to put down what actually happens. He's like, I'm just, he's like, screw everyone saying how the world should be. I'm just going to try to put down what's actually happening. So you can be against someone trying to do that. Um, but if they're right, you're going to, you're going to have a, you're going to have a tough time. Yeah. It's and, like, uh, you have to, you have to be significantly smarter than Hegel then, because then, then it would be, Action, you know, if he's like, this is what's actually happening, and you said, aha, no, this is what's actually happening in the world. Mm -hmm. And then Marx did that, didn't he? He did do that. He sort of <laughs> did that. Yeah. Yeah, no, he definitely uh, but did. But again, uh, what's so different about Hegel is he was the guy who said that basically, fuck, um, like trying to imagine the future. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to literally describe what is on going on right now. And yeah. uh, I'm not going to do any any of that, you know attempts at uh, being a smart pro prophet, you know? Yeah. Which is very important. Like, even Marx attempted to be a sort of a prophet, but, well, he basically extrapolated his assumption about the world and into the future, right? And, like, looks how class should resolve itself. But then again, as uh, many post-Marxists, you know, pointed out, uh, for example, Gramsci, uh, like, Marx is not a messiah. He's not a... He's not... He, he's a very naughty boy. Uh, and uh, that's good. You know, we we should we should keep in mind that Marx wasn't a Marxist; he was a Hegelian. And actually, uh, that's a nice way of me turning back um, to the book um, *Judaism in the Clinic*. Uh, in the, I believe, in the very like in the first part of the book, you yeah. mentioned how Jung always said that he is one thing that he's not. He's not a union, and how he's glad he's not a union. Yeah, he's glad he's not a union. He and saw the how, fruits of his labor, and he wasn't. Yeah, <laughs> and how um, Lacan said that you can be a Lacanian, but I'm definitely not. Um, and uh, my question is, um, are you a Lacanian? I'd like to say I'm the like to be a real. It's it's simply the truth, though. I'm the pioneer of Zizekian psychotherapy. I'm the guy who's writing writing out what Zizekian psychotherapy means. Uh, that is in a sort of, that means being a Lacanian mm -hmm. to a certain extent, but being a Lacanian analyst means being a psychoanalyst. Um, yeah. So I would say it's Lacanian, it's psychodynamic therapy. It's a, uh, but it's, it's Zizekian psychodynamic therapy. There's no other way to uh, put it. It's applying his philosophy and, and, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I gave it. myself a surplus that couldn't be filled. It's about applying his philosophy, and and then there's a then here we go. <laughs> there's a surplus that can't. It's like that's that's all encompassing. <laughs> yeah, uh, what would what would be the second signifier? It'd be interesting because I think you could say the second signifier: philosophy and method of communicating that philosophy to some extent mm -hmm. uh, into psychotherapy. Uh, what is interesting about your book is one of your basic, like, uh, basic suggestions to um, basic to psycho basic suggestions for change in psychotherapy is uh, psychotherapeutic education, right? 
is uh, oh, correct gigantic that could be anything but that is a necessary that is what it is and then i expand on what that yeah involves uh you gave a very very interesting example of lacan uh getting a bunch of people with in the from what i got he works in the psych ward and he basically got a bunch of people who were in the psych ward and he got them in a church and he started basically lecturing them is that correct yeah that is correct according to um, yeah yeah according to this french lacan documentary <laughs> uh do you think that we should be doing the same should no we lecturing uh, <laughs> No. people like what, <laughs> what's your suggestion then there's a notion in that the no the notional quality of he just got a bunch of people together and gave them the same information so you mm -hmm. have to be like doing an informational group Ooh, i almost spilled my starbucks there It'd be a shame if i spill my starbucks while talking to bullshit with bistro <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that um i think we can do individual psychotherapy and give people the information that they need, which means the therapist has some sort of knowledge, but mm -hmm. mostly it means not disavowing that the therapist assumes they know something. You can't, you can't escape. One of the things I'm, I, I write in the beginning is therapists are constantly disavowing that they know anything and they think it's for the client's benefit. It's like, oh, I, uh, the client's the one who teaches us. Lacan says that as well. Even. Mm -hmm. um, but, Zizek, his, the material form of psychotherapy has an ideology to it that you cannot escape. Um, which well, what is, is this ideology? The, you, there's a client who comes into the room, they sit down in a chair, and there's a therapist who comes into the room, they sit down in a chair, and the client gives the therapist money for the therapist's expertise, the therapist's knowledge. So a priori, a priori to anything, um, the therapist is assuming knowledge just based on the material form of psychotherapy, which then they go about disavowing. And I'm saying, okay, mm -hmm. let's be let's be let's be frank. Um, th what the therapist already has an assumed knowledge. What is that knowledge? How do we and how do we communicate with the client in regards to that knowledge? And how do we so, not use that knowledge and be like, oh, I have the knowledge, and you're so you listen to me, which is no. So how do we avoid that while not disavowing this material form that uh, gives therapists um, the, the purveyors of knowledge, the doctors, the medical apparatus, right? So if I got it correctly, uh, what we need is we need basically a more dynamic communication between a client and a therapist that is uh, more two-sided than one-sided, basically, no. you know, than explain. <laughs> No, total, totally incorrect. Okay, explain. <laughs> 100% not what I was saying. <laughs> no, okay. but I mean, I think, I think, um, do we, do we need two sided? So that's, that's like, that's so universal. That could be anything. Like any therapist would agree with that currently. It's like, do we need, yeah, every single therapist in the clinic would agree with you. Um, mm -hmm. what I'm saying is there's, there's material, there's ideology within the material form of psychotherapy that's being disavowed by therapists. They need to be able to recognize um, that they're not always the good pseudo anarchistic, you know, purveyors of of happiness, right? Mm -hmm. They're they're inhabiting this material form that's intrinsically ideological, and then how do you how do you overcome that? And then the process, the math theme, which I think most people probably just like when okay, here's a math theme. I was like, I gave myself one math theme. I was like, I can do one, which is. Um, which is the void, you know, you start, the, ther the, the client starts out as the void and mm -hmm. the therapist is the one with the knowledge and then through the therapy process, the client's knowledge and their negotiating of deadlocks then encounters the void, which is the unknown of uh, the future events, which is the algorithmic sort of open-ended uh, end game, right? Mm-hmm. And then I further, that's only like part, that's not even the end of the book. So then I further, it's like, okay, what does that mean? And then I, mm -hmm. you know, I talk about that. Yeah. So talking about the book, Zizek read the book or not? Zizek, Zizek is currently reading the book. <laughs> <laughs> Last I heard from him. Uh, what did I uh, heard did... from him briefly. It's not, I don't want to, I don't want to pretend we're like, like oh so yeah, me and Slavo, we but he he's been uh, the few interactions I've had with him are have been really nice, and I just want to mm -hmm. keep it at that level. And I'm a I'm quite frankly afraid of like 
just just like I don't I don't want to I don't I'm keeping all my interactions with him very brief. All my interactions <laughs> with him have been very brief. So it's like, oh, that's good. Okay, let's end, and then I'll run away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Is it is it because is it because uh, you are um, afraid of his response to uh, your book, or is it more of a it's so good that you don't want to spoil that? You know, he it's not at this point. It's not. I'm not afraid of his response to my book because mm-hmm. he was glad. He seemed you know, sounds like he was. He's glad I wrote the book, mm-hmm. and he finds it interesting. So that so when I heard that, I was like, oh, that's that's nice. So he doesn't think yeah. like I was afraid he was gonna think you know it's like oh what's this guy doing with my theories and putting my name on his book, so <laughs> it, it it's turned out to not be that so that's nice. Well, I believe that would be very hypocritical hypocritical of Zizek to do that because he's the person who says that every single philosopher misinterprets the one who came before. So basically, he says that uh, basically, like um, Marx misinterpreted Hegel, Hegel misinterpreted everyone, and Aristotle misinterpreted uh, like Plato. Everyone misinterpreted yeah. everyone, and that's normal because that's very good to misinterpret each other because we can create something uh, out of this interpretation which is original. So even yeah. if you completely miss the mark on whatever Zizek is talking about, like <laughs> if you completely miss the mark on Lacan, like it doesn't matter because you have created something out of it, you know, out of this misinterpretation. Yeah. Which of course the idea is like, well, sure, oh, I know all of this consciously, and that's true, and yet, mm-hmm. and yet the underlying pathology is the still the belief in it that that maintains. It's like, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Even so, I would be very upset. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, or I would have been. So that's been. A, so now I can. Now I. Now I don't feel like I'm negotiating. I'm trying to manipulate him and being into being like, oh yeah, this is a good book. So now that you said, oh okay, I'm reading it. I find it interesting. I'm glad you did this. Now I can say, oh good. I was really worried about that. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. So um, what uh. Let us uh, turn. Uh, there is a question in the chat that I would like to ask you. Does Jijik even want to avoid that? Just telling the client what the therapist knows uh, and they don't. Wait, what does that mean? Uh, chat, please reformulate the question. I apologize. So let us talk a bit about um, psychotherapy as um, political. Uh, like, is psychotherapy a political thing? Is it politicized? Because basically, what I remember you mentioned somewhere is that without uh, an end game that you are proposing, basically, yeah. uh, psychotherapy is just two people talking to each other in a room. Let's call it. Well, yeah. Right? Like, for instance, for instance, if you just, if you if you go if you take therapists at their word who say I don't have a knowledge, the client is the one who informs me, mm-hmm. then you're immediately in an ethical dilemma, it's like, then why Why should they be talking to you? Yeah. And then you say, well, because I'm a therapist. And it's like, so you have a knowledge, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's that specific, uh, that's that last part of your question. But what, what, say that first part of your question again. Uh, what what are possible? the political implication of uh, psychoanalysis, uh, psychotherapy? Yeah, so you could call it a hyper, it's almost like a hyper politic, which is why I think the zero book engagement with psych psychoanalysis and Zizek tend to be kind of trippy because it is it is um a sort of condensation of uh the sort of I guess geist <laughs> mm-hmm. um the way that people interact and the sort of unconscious values come out materially in psychotherapy, which is the unconscious value of, of Western uh society, liberal society is oh okay, everyone we should all be individuals. And then you become radically confronted by the fact that those categories aren't enough to to be useful mm-hmm. in in psychotherapy. So I think maybe you could um, you maybe for a law that would be useful. It's like okay, you're an individual, ergo you have individual rights. So for a law that would make sense. Um, but in psychotherapy, what you get is the sophistry of common sense and people getting just a touch of, they have a touch of cognitive behavioral therapy under their belt and then they have all their common sense and they just string their common sense through the little bit of cognitive behavioral therapy and they call themselves a therapist 
and no one's there to say no fuck you yeah <laughs> i'm saying fuck you no <laughs> <laughs> that's simply you know there's an entire there's an entire history of western thought that isn't being engaged with and there's other thought too but i don't i, I can't speak on that because i don't know much and i know yeah. a lot of, i know a lot about western philosophy but not you know i try I try to vaguely, besides the point, <laughs> besides the point. So basically your problem is that psychotherapy doesn't engage that much with uh, basically um, phil philosophy, you could say? Yes, because there's a material ideology within the form of psychotherapy of therapist and client um, mm -hmm. that says the therapist knows something about thought and how you should think. And then the therapist goes, yeah. oh, they go and disavow that in a million different ways. And they say, no, you be yourself. We, we're just here to discover. No, fuck you. Fuck you. <laughs> fuck you. So, you are going into the room and you're telling people that you know what is a good way to think. Or else you would not, there would no, be no such thing as a client and a therapist. There would be just people, you know, sitting in Talking the circle, the sharing their experiences Correct. or something like that. Yeah. Correct. We, isn't it silly, like, that this sort of thing is happening? Because, like, people who, for example, you went to university and you taught all, you, like, learned all of that. It's very specific things that you've learned. You've learned, uh, like, what Freud thought about how the mind works. You talk to, you all those, like, very specialized knowledge. Why is that uh, therapists don't recognize that they are basically experts in this relationship? Why do they refuse to accept the ideology? They refuse to because it's difficult to accept responsibility and they don't know how to and they think the disavowal of responsibility is morally superior. They think because it sounds morally superior. So it's mm -hmm. like it doesn't it it simply sounds better as propaganda to say to your client, "Oh, you're the one who discovers." And I don't come in with the knowledge. Or they might like uh -huh. brush it aside and be like, "Oh, I know a certain thing." But that's how liberal capitalism works. It works to be a sloganeering and rhetoric over over substance. And it doesn't challenge people to engage with their substantive values that define the rest of the stuff. So they you know, so they're they're taught coping mechanisms and they're taught rhetoric, which which is why I was saying earlier, it's almost it's almost fun to get like symptom reduction, but it's not, mm -hmm. it's not psychotherapy. I always try to give my clients, you know, psychotherapy, but like mm -hmm. if, if you come in and be like, okay, uh, you want to reduce depression from this number to this number and you want to reduce anxiety from this number to this number. Well then the pure, <laughs> the pure game theory of that is then you get them to define their levels lower. Oh, you know? and that's Don't it. You just, th well, that's, that's your goal, period. That's your goal. And okay. then you can then you can BS, you know, and, mm -hmm. and engage with them however you want. But so you know, a lot of times I'll have that goal in a client with a client, and um, you know, within a couple sessions, maybe you know they they'll they'll be like, oh yeah, my depression's at a one, my anxiety's at a one, I'm doing great. Oh, but I'm really worried about this, mm. <laughs> <laughs> right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, game theory wise, I'm doing great. They're like, this is they, the boss, the boss man says to Elliot, Elliot, this is your goal. And I'm like, oh, great. It's done. And then like the worst part is I even I'll like highlight that. But then you get that disavowal, which is um, like, no, I really am at a one and a one anyway. So I've been really worrying about this and I've been really depressed about this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> so what you need is you need substantive engagement. Mm -hmm. You need engagement with the, the deadlocks, things which are <clears throat> not synthesizable, you know? They don't, mm -hmm. they don't go into this and become the magic individual who then grows and then you're, you know, and then you're, and then everything is good. And now you're, now you're tranquil. Now you have, now that you have tranquility, which you didn't have before, now you're the completed psychotherapeutic sub subject. It's mm -hmm. like, no, give them, give them something to engage with the deadlocks that they're going to come up against. Actually, that's a uh, very interesting thing that you mentioned that could, could there actually theoretically exist this, you know, whole complete therapeutic subject that has completed the, you know, went through the therapy and uh, did all the things that were told and now is sort of, you know, tr tr in the in the state of tranquility, completely, you know, like basically no. and he leaves the, the office and 
done. I mean, no, but uh, the problem is they know that and they will also say no. However, mm -hmm. the material sort of, the way that the act says more than what they're saying. So then they disavow it's like, of course that's not true. Like you'll hear Peterson sound reasonable, speaking of, speaking of Zizek v. Peterson, as, mm -hmm. we, as we were a little bit before is, He'll always disavow, and then you then you have to go back to the act. It's like, okay, sure, but you are only giving your client like breathing techniques, or you're giving them this way to say, oh, this like sort of new age stoicism, like yeah. uh, which is just like, oh, is it the end of the world? No, well, of course it's not the end of the world. But there, you know, there's another substantive level, which is the level of the conflicts and how to negotiate those conflicts mm -hmm. or deadlocks. In, in yeah. a way that's not just resign, just get pulled by whatever, whatever recaptures your desire, whatever, you know, whether it be Starbucks or, or um, anything else, right? Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, basically this is a question that I wanted to ask a psychotherapist, you know, that um, to basically, especially a left-wing psychotherapist, uh, in... In capitalist realism, uh, Mark Fisher basically says a very interesting thing about depression. What he says is what people like, what the capitalist realist ideology does, it sort of privatizes mental health yes. in a way that it's basically what depression is in the eyes uh, of the late capitalist ideology is chemical imbalance. And it's your brain, it's your chemical imbalance, yeah. done. I would say they, that's a good point that Mark Fisher and uh, mm -hmm. Jody Dean and all the all the rest of um, you know sort of neo Zizekians. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's not a good that's not a good phrase, but I can't <laughs> neo Zizekian. It will be <laughs> Just, good once like Zizek is dead and it's like three oh, no, thirty no, years at least no. done. You know, it's like then it's okay. All right, so. <laughs> but like my question is. Um, how accurate no, but is yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so it's it's not because, in a quite literal sense, your depression is a singular event. So if you disavow it to uh, simply your circumstances around you, you're just wrong. Mm -hmm. um, Why? You're simply wrong because it's your mood. It's your mood. It's not um, society's mood. It's it's your sort of it's your sort of functioning within that society, right? The second part is so. How do you change that? Well, so what what should be your role? Should you resign to essentially? Oh, okay. I live. Let's say you live in like Nazi Germany, mm -hmm. and then I I was doing therapy in Nazi Germany, although I'm Jewish, and I'm doing. And then I, you know, <laughs> okay. And somebody says, "Man, I'm really depressed. Um, the Nazis are here. They're a bunch of fucking assholes. Um, mm -hmm. They're killing lots of people." And then I said, "Well, you know what? Your depression is the Nazis' fault." Because you can't live under fascism, because fascism is a bad uh, uh, governance system. Mm -hmm. that's, that's just wrong in terms of approaching mental health. Mental health is intrinsically an individual pursuit. If you want to disavow all individual pursuits, which um, I think that happens a lot on the left, because it's very pragmatic too, because you don't need to engage with individual pursuits necessarily to be a leftist critic of a of a systemic process because uh -huh. then you have to find some way to create a notion out of the person and how do they, how do people reflect this certain uh, notion mm -hmm. and that, which is sort of intrinsically you're taking the person's, you know, whatever their mental health state might be, you sort of reduce it to a singular notion and then see how mm -hmm. those notional quantities interact as a system. So you can, in a sense, in leftist critique, remove, the individual, and it's not necessarily wrong to remove the individual. However, um, psychotherapy psychotherapy is actual in the world. It it exists, mm -hmm. and it and would you say that? Oh, psycho seeing a therapist. I mean, go to the end here. I you know sometimes I re yeah anyway, go to the end here, <laughs> and uh -huh. and say okay. So you would say to someone in, who's depressed in Nazi Germany not to see. A psychotherapist if they're on the verge of suicide because the Nazis are in fact bad. No, 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 no you would not. never say that. That's because 
there's there is that individual mental health component it's not simply depression is not simply um a social issue although the person could right rightly argue like man you know i don't think i'd be so depressed if uh if uh my entire family was wasn't killed and i'm hiding in an addict mm -hmm. uh, an addict that's a funny one <laughs> yeah, hiding in the addict it, yeah, actually I'm a sober, very I'm a sober interesting person. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I trust you. Yeah. But wouldn't you say that still again, uh, basically, even if we look beyond basically <laughs> those, you know, big stuff, like you've said, like, for example, Nazi Germany, but let's say basically that the, um, that other material, actual material, uh, there are actual material reasons for uh, depression to occur. And looking at the source of it is, is important. Because, like, I don't believe that Mark Fisher in, his, in Capitalist Realism just said, oh, that's that's capitalism and neoliberalism's fault. And if we, like, he, he mentioned that. He I know mentioned Jody how... Dean specifically said that. Um, mm -hmm. I believe, he, but... I believe uh, he was quoting that. Uh, you know, I don't think it's him originally writing that. It was a quote. So, okay. uh, but wouldn't you say that... Um, th it's there is a trend of uh, ignoring the actual material conditions of uh, a human yes. a, a human in the world. Yes, and that's the problem. So it's it's, it's oh, hard hello? to negotiate. Hello, oh, can you hear me? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You lagged out for a second on a very fun note. You said yes, and you froze with your finger in the air. <laughs> <laughs> can you repeat that once again? Yes. <laughs> yeah, thank but, you. Uh, <laughs> So that is the problem, and that's I think what Marxists are frustrated with is uh, people do ma ignore material conditions that people need, but you don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. But you also don't need to reduce it. You can you can see these on a parallax. You can see these two things never coming together: the individual yeah. responsibility and also the material conditions, and they're related. The mm -hmm. say living being depressed that you're hiding in an attic, <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, also, you know, there is some individual culpability for your for your mental health. Those can be driven on on a on a parallax in that sort of form of the Mobius strip, where it's like should mm -hmm. they they go into each other, but they don't quite come together, right? And that's right. that's a difficult thing for people to grapple with because people already have difficulty grappling with there are material causes or they have difficulty grappling what exactly is my individual responsibility but once you've sort of figured out um once you read zizek in the clinic a revolutionary proposal <laughs> game of no no but really once once you're engaged with uh critical theory and psychoanalytic theory to a certain extent uh mm -hmm. then you you learn I would say the point you get to is that sort of unsynthesizable. How do how are these related? How how do these deadlocks relate? And what do we do about them? And what are they negotiated with? And, yeah. and I think where I, maybe me and Zizek would differ is um, Zizek says, "Don't act, think." Mm -hmm. um, I would say that's I would say a think a thought is not necessarily not an act. Um, well, yeah. It is an act. I would agree. But that's important. It's not like, oh, yeah, that is an act, but who cares? It's like, it's an act that then causes, you know, if you look at a cognitive shift, like behavioral shift, emotional shift, mm -hmm. thought shifts, and it changes your entire how you go about the rest of your sort of existence in terms of, you know, if a change in you. In a you know in a quite literal sense, if we're talking only on the level of self consciousness of you know psychotherapy, which is you know not very it's not the end of Hegel. It's like and this is why you need more than self consciousness. It's like totally, mm -hmm. but a change in you uh, quite changes the ideal form of the object. So the object as perceived by self consciousness. Mm -hmm. So it's you can't you can't sort of um. You can't sort of get away from the fact that your thoughts th as an act is a restructuring of the ideal forms of of the objects and I think that's where um where where Marxists and Zizek might have a real clash because they have a clash in um theory 
Yeah. And yeah, that's that's the clash. Is is uh, does the material is the material the primary component, or is the ideal the primary component? And I, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I think you could say uh, material exists, ideals exist, and they're on a parallax. They don't come together. Yeah. And, and I think Ziz I think Zizek's writing more about that. I think his next book's going to be on that. Um, sex and uh, something else. Yeah, that's on the failing, the fragile absolute. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I look through the context. Uh, through th they have uh, basically uh, some information about the book already out, and um, the table of context, the the contents. They also it's also out. Um, so I'm not really sure whether I have remember seeing anything like that but there were some very very complicated words and i, I and i felt like a complete dum-dum yeah. but i sort of enjoy the sort of feeling in some way <laughs> but um uh, i have a question so have you read peterson yeah and in fact i enjoy um although he moved back to washington probably maybe because i did this <laughs> i have a friend oh, who's what? like an an i have a friend who's an anarchist who also mm -hmm. who helps me admin um, the Freud group that I run on Facebook mm -hmm. and, he, and and I sort of, I was like, we're going to listen to 12 rules for life. Right. And mm -hmm. he's just, he's just so the most anti Peterson person <laughs> as, yeah, as anti Peter Peterson as you can get. And I would just sort of, so mm -hmm. yeah, I, I've, I've heard Peterson talk. Um, when I was, when I did a, a talk at Boise regarding refuting, uh, Jordan Peterson before that, I actually saw him talk in person. Mm -hmm. and I sort of walked up to him, to him afterwards, and I said, <laughs> "I said to him, I said, hey, uh, hey, he, he was already arguing with zero books." And I was like, "Hey, I'm the zero books author." And I was like, <laughs> "How did he react I, to that?" Because I remember that he called oh, off the debate like, oh, okay. and raised the price. I was like, "Hey, you know, but I'm refuting. I'm, I'm refuting you." <laughs> I said, "I'm refuting uh -huh. you." And he goes, "Good luck with that." And I was like, "Oh, great." Uh, <laughs> Fuck him. <laughs> fuck him. Yeah, but like, uh, um, we can't really fuck him completely because there is a thing that is going on, which yeah. is the Zizek Peterson debate. I, I you and, know, even though I said yeah. fuck him, like at the same time, it's like, I, 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 I can't be, I can't share my colleague's anger at Jordan Peterson because, in terms of psychotherapists, uh huh, psychotherapists are like. <laughs> You know, the level of engagement with information and the history of thought is not great. So I'm seeing him on this pers on this spectrum of psychotherapists engagement with the history of thought. Mm -hmm. And like if, if I look at him compared to like, for instance, people at his, I would say, his level of of um, like expertise or whatever, or age level and also experience okay. level in psychotherapy psychotherapy at least at least he's like trying <laughs> like if, oh, he would, okay. if he was my i can't like even though i know it, his implication is like so much worse for because it's it, he's directly engaging with society i cannot help but to see him in this sort of very technical perspective as a as a psychotherapy person trying to engage with thought because you know mm -hmm. i talk with people and people engage with you know, the world is like, oh, everything is the one thing. It's all one energy. And then there's Kabbalah. Not that Nick Land doesn't engage with Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. so, but yeah. no, that's that's what the psychotherapy profession is. Like people, like you should know that. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of room for a lot of different personal philosophies mm -hmm. in your psychotherapist. So um, psychotherapists, <laughs> uh, some of them are literally everything is water and uh, some of them are Kabbalists. Yeah. Is, is it is it actually a thing that is uh, those are, those are two, yeah those are those are two of my current um those are that's just the hallway that I'm on okay. <laughs> <Amazing>. <laughs> they're great Love that. they're great I'm just saying like per personal philosophy um uh-huh there's work to be done in terms okay. of the engagement with the history of Western thought. Because that was really confused me. Like that, Pete, uh, Jordan Peterson is with all of his stuff, right? He is. Uh, is he a practicing psychotherapist? Not or anymore. I doubt it. Yeah, but he, he was. did have a practice. He right? a, yeah, he was a psychologist, but um, oh, he, a psychologist. he engaged okay. in psychotherapy though. 
uh-huh. which psychologist means you do psych testing as well and stuff. Yeah. So, w- which really confused me because, like, uh, I look at his politics. I try to look at his uh, sort of, you know, base philosophy where he's coming through, and I'm like, um, I was even like, it's so it went so bad that my hairdresser in Minsk in Belarus <laughs> said that oh, there is this very interesting book uh, that that philosopher wrote. Uh, and she she basically said that her her another client's son is really into Peterson, and I was yeah. like, oh no, that's like I had to explain to my hairdresser that that sort of stuff in twelve. Uh, uh, 12 rules for life is sort of workable but like um, it, it's i basically try to explain why self-help is bad from my standpoint i never thought that i will have this discussion while you know be while my hair is being cut in minsk yeah. but i didn't have that discussion which is very scary in terms of how influential this sort of stuff is and uh, once your basic critique of uh, self-help overall and that specific self-help that peterson perpetuates uh, self-help about. overall as a genre is usually really reductionist and uh, basically a book of aphorisms, which is like, I guess, you know, I'm not against mm-hmm. it in that I'm not against people getting information from fiction either if it like helps them or, or whatever. Yeah. But but um, I think it would be really interesting if there was a self-help available that critically engaged with psychoanalytic theory. That's my oh. sort of DIY, DIY thing. In terms of like, I have a Facebook group and people talk it through memes or whatever, but at least they're engaging with um, uh, psychoanalytic theory and philosophy on a very, you know, in a level that um, you don't have access to a group hashing out ideas. And it gets like really mm-hmm. basic on one level, it goes your mom, it's like your mom too. And this is what I think about seminar 23 or seminar 20. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I think about Hegel. Your mom. This is what I think about uh, like psychology of everyday life. Your mom. Oh, and by the way, that register, it's it's your mom. That, that that's nice and it's stable. It's a stable register that like superficial it's a engagement with Freud. Thing, your mom. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of nice. It gives you like a, a pause. It's like when you're talking to Hegel and then you like scroll. And then yeah. some, someone making a your mom joke or something. Amazing. <laughs> so I, I is would it like an open page? Is it an open page? Can you Sigmund send the Freud's link to that? Dank meme stash. I just made a new logo for it too. I'm really proud of my little modernist logo I made. Uh, send it's, on, me that. it's on the. It's on. Yeah, I'll send. I'll send it to you. It's on Facebook. Sigmund Freud's dank meme stash. <laughs> okay, people. If you if you're interested in this sort of content, if you want to look at your mom jokes and some very very specific inner memes about Lacan's fucking uh, lectures, like, but please. this is no joke. It's like you might think, oh, because when uh-huh. people have theory groups, they have like 20, 200, 300 people. I, you know, I don't fuck around when it comes to recapturing techno capital. You know, we have we have okay. eighty four thousand people in it. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, no, that's no joke. Nice. Like I have, like, when I say recapture drive, I'm like, hey, watch out. Um, but but every every theory is just an upside down roadmap for reactionaries, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. But as Vizek yeah. said, when it comes to when it comes to the digital frontier, you need it's like you need to you need to get it, like, because mm-hmm. <laughs> it's anarchistic and there's discourse happening, and um, yeah. If you don't recapture and hold territory, um, like this is since this is Bolshevik radio, Bolshevik bistro. <laughs> uh, let's talk Lenin for a second. Okay. Um, you need you would need a digital sort of vanguard uh, based on notional concepts. Mm-hmm. For instance, Jordan Peterson has recaptured Jung in the digital space. That mm-hmm. is not a given. Like Jung is not Jordan Peterson. Yeah. Like, by a long shot. Right. So if when people type in Freud, they get nothing but your mom jokes, eventually it'll turn, you know, into, you know, your mom jokes and maybe Peterson or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I would argue the group wouldn't be as popular as it is if I didn't sort of take this and then sort of say, here's some theory, here's some theory, just just constantly Mm -hmm. people engaging with theory on a sort of different level. And that's not what you get in a Jordan Peterson group. Yeah. You'll get like, oh, society is. You know, the feminists and whatever. (laughs) 
Yeah. And Jordan exactly. Peterson was like, well, that's not my fault. That's my fan base. Eh? It's like, um, no. notice how I'm not talking to them. I'm talking to Bolshevik Vistra. That's kind of my fault. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, it, yeah, your 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 fan base is your fault to some extent. It's like there's it a is. reason why they're your fan base. It <laughs> is because you cultivate your audience. That's yeah, exactly. like actively, not only passively, but actively with your decisions that you make, with the the questions that you choose out of the. You know, it's like if you actually sit around and you look at your comment section and you do Q and A, right, and you'll just allow everyone to send you questions, and you precisely choose questions like, uh, like, um, like the. Uh, some rando talking about the Jewish question, and you specifically choose that, you will attract a certain kind of audience. You will attract a certain kind of people who would be interested in that. You know, yeah, and exactly. that, that's not only in your theory per se, because I believe that um, you could, uh, it's very easy to reduce, oh, it's just based on the theory, right? Because, but how many different people are engaging with leftist theory? How many different people are reading Marx, for example? You know, yeah. it's very, 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 very different people from a ideological standpoint. And uh, it's it's about what, what you write and what you do, but also what you do to the audience. How do you interact and how do you cultivate yeah. that? Exactly. Cultivation is extremely fucking important. Yeah, um, like if you, like, take the Jewish question on face value, like Jordan Peterson does as a Jewish yeah, person. Yeah, he literally, He's like, like... Well, you know, they're a high IQ group or whatever. He started so doing no the IQ meme. Successful. And, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, don't be surprised, you know, when uh, when you find uh, basically that the you know neo uh, real neo Nazis in America are like reading Peterson and uh, cleaning their rooms, etc., and yeah, using exactly. that as the basis for their personal ideology. Yeah, yeah, exactly, because uh, that's the whole thing. If he didn't want that to happen, he would have a very strict anti-fascist outlook, and uh, well, he despite does. the fact that he. He, he, he sort does. of does. That's well. That's that's the problem. Is he does, but he doesn't know how to do it in a. Yeah. He doesn't. He doesn't quite know, or he's not. Rather, I think he thinks radical honesty, uh, equals being pulled in by this algorithm of a neo-Nazi asking about the Jewish question and him mm -hmm. like really trying to flesh out the Jewish question. It's like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's no. That's why it's necessary to have a, to sort of. Um, challenge right-wing pseudo authenticity because mm -hmm. when they say authenticity let's look at what that involves that that involves hedonistic um recapture by whatever sort of environment you're in and unquestioning mm -hmm. obedience to authority as as sort of important right yeah so that's so authenticity it, I, it feels like authenticity to them because they're not cognitively fleshing stuff out or they're not engaging with um intrinsic ideological contradiction mm -hmm. so i think i think if you look at authenticity as a signifier right. i think it means it feels natural right mm -hmm. so yeah I'm, it's authentic if i'm just sort of uh on the couch and just saying whatever i whatever i say how authentic of me what yeah. i really mean is that sort of feels natural and another way to look at it is you're not engaging with contradictions cognitively and you're not yeah you know, so it's it's bullshit. It's I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but like I can't yeah. I can't like like I said, it's like from like the this is what I do for a living, psychotherapy. Not I don't talk. Mm -hmm. I talk to podcasts and I and I you know politics. I engage with politics on a you know on, a, on any level I can, but it's not where I um it's not my uh, technical like job. Like I'm not a I'm not Lenin at a coffee shop yeah. planning planning a you know. A, an invasion of Russia or whatever, or even in the House of Representatives is like a neoliberal, and that would be their like, that would be their, that would be their job. So I, I can I can only sort of I can't escape. It's like yeah I know Peterson's bad, but then mm -hmm. my like hidden my hidden ideology that I'm I want to call myself out on is I mm -hmm. can't help but to see him as a therapist, and I know how bad therapists can get with their personal ideology. Yeah, and he's he's just another therapist with like. He's got some, he's got some, you know, he's got some <laughs> reactionary views. Yeah. You know? Um, you know what? As we're touching, uh, first of all, before we move, I want to talk a bit more about Peterson and Jizik debate, uh, directly engage yeah. with the subject. But before we do that, uh, I actually, you mentioned Lenin in context of your, um, you know, of Yeah, let's the, talk Lenin. <laughs> uh, 
I, I just wanted to quickly mention one of his quotes that specifically is about the, you know, the Freudian group on Facebook, et cetera, oh, et cetera, online space. Um, what Lenin said in the 20s, I believe, um, is a very, very important thing for us now. He said, at that time, for us, the most important, uh, I, I can't, I know it's in Russian perfectly. I don't know the correct, you know, party official translation into English. But he said that for us, the most important um, art vein of art is remains to be cinema. And at the time he said, the cinema is the thing. It's the medium we should be very, it's very important for us to engage with it and be there where the people's eyes are, et cetera, et cetera. Which is now basically a true Marxist-Leninist approach would to say that it's for us the most important because this is where the eyes are, this is where the people are address, uh, directing their view, this is where they engage with the thoughts, engage with the opinions, this is where the communication happens. So ultimately, a true Leninist view on that would be that it is important, extremely important, to be on the internet right now, and be here and uh, to take control over the, so to say, the discourse, and be involved in that discourse, not to not to get shouted down basically by the reactionaries. Yeah. So that's sort of the Leninist approach it's, to that. It's true, and. And but once again, the parallax is such an important concept in terms mm -hmm. of these things are related, but they don't they don't necessarily come together, which is sort yeah, of ideology and the actual sort of sometimes you know like the level of the level of law. It's not a law until it's a law. It's not it's not a new government until mm -hmm. it's an, until it's a new government. It's not a new yeah. structure. This is new structure and that ideological register of the movies they might not catch up to it i like what zizek said about um trotsky and mm -hmm. it's like sure okay lenin you do the big revolution afterwards yeah but he already won the revolution before when he took over these key sort of areas and then like overnight yeah. it's just the other people had <laughs> control of the areas right mm -hmm. like for instance you know freud discourse on on the on facebook <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's like okay now Freud discourse on Facebook is run by Zizek in the clinic guy. <laughs> that's not you know, and that's you know every person who engages with Freud now engages with uh, Zizek in the Western canon, which is not a given. Freud didn't engage with the Western canon. His his yeah. viewpoint was he didn't want his he he saw himself as an you know an empirical scientist, um, uh -huh. ironically, and and he really tried yeah. to just he tried to figure it out. He like really wanted to uh -huh. just figure it out himself. To go in and test yeah. it. It's yeah, you know who read you know who read Hegel is Jung. Jung read Hegel, not well. <laughs> but oh, he read uh -huh. but he read Hegel and he has a sort of bad version of Hegel, like the collective consciousness. Like uh -huh. when I'm trying to explain um you know, and when I try to explain to people like the good therapist, like if you're a good therapist, you know what the collective unconscious is. Like you just know what it is. Like, that's how I would say, that's the, like, you don't understand the absolute state of psychotherapy is not engaged with the theory of psychotherapy or the history of psychoanalysis. <laughs> it's, not. Uh -huh. it's messed up, man. So it's like, it's like, okay, at least you know who Jung is and have some brief, okay, so maybe I can ta then talk to you about Hegel and how consciousness uh, functions outside uh, the person how ideas sort of take on their own form and then people become mm -hmm. secondary to, to ideas and how there's a material, uh, you know, representation of the ideology, but it's not just a representation. It is, in fact, the ideology of itself, which is different than just saying everyone shares their own thoughts and synchronicity, which is like Jung's. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's got this, like, bad hegelianism but it's hard to be a good hegelian like i think the internet age has allowed me to be a good hegelian because mm -hmm. i get to talk with like <laughs> you just can you can at a philosopher yeah <laughs> you can at them and just ask you can, them i can email thing. zizek i'm like hey zizek i can go you know i can go hey jody dean you know you're kind of wrong on this and then she'll uh -huh. go she can hit the block button she didn't hit the block button but I, <laughs> she was she she certainly didn't she certainly, I don't think, agrees with me. Mm -hmm. Although, although I think the official position, if I were her, would be, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, shut up. So I have to like, cut you off, all right? Okay. Yeah. And to ask you a question, 
uh, as we know, the topic of the debate between Zizek and Peterson is happiness, capitalism versus Marxism. When I first heard that, I was really, really, really confused because yeah. that's a um, very weird way to not only frame Zizek, you know, as defender of Marxism, like it's 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 just like very reductive, uh, but also to structure it all around happiness. So yeah. Zizek hates the concept of happiness, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Well, what's the? I would say there's a notional truth in that, which is uh -huh. which is which is better to live in, Marxism or uh, capitalism. I think that's the notion. So the signifiers and the logic of the signifiers are a little stupid. Mm -hmm. um, but the notion is: is it better to be in a Marxist government or a capitalist government? Right. So that if they framed it like that, it would make a lot more sense. I think the way yeah. that they. Yeah, but I think um, I think um, they framed it in happiness. So now I yeah, hope they don't get caught up in happiness because the real the the question that they're really trying to engage with, maybe they need a Zizeki and psychotherapist such as myself <laughs> <laughs> to help them get at the notional because that you know that's what I try to do is like what's the notion of this year, which is you know is it better to live in a Marxist government or a capitalist government. And then furthermore, is it better if the U.S. was a Marxist government or a capitalist government? Mm -hmm. Would there be food lines if there was a Marxist government? There's already food lines in a, you know, a capitalist government. You're already saying, oh, poor people are just poor. And that's just how it is in a capitalist government. How, yeah. how about that? How about, how about Los Angeles has an entire, like, you know, area that's cut off from the rest of Los Angeles where people live off $200 a month from, yeah. you know, from, uh, from the government and are having to figure out how to find food all the time. So, and that's, that's with our help. So with some people don't have help of um, community centers that do psychotherapy and case management and all that. Mm -hmm. Some people are just living off, you know, 200 bucks a month and they're like, damn, how am I going to live? And then they won't have enough food. And yeah. Well, so it's like, so, and people go, well, yeah, sure. But who cares? It's like, well, hold up. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you're, you're arguing that capitalism is better for the individual. And then, but here's an individual and, right there yeah, living at really, $200 without anything. Yeah. So then, what do you do about people living on the margins like this? What, it, what's, what's your structure of society? Would you rather? And then ultimately, you would have to say, I would rather live in a society um, that's structured in a more um, functional way for those people that are living off of $200 a month or something like that, mm -hmm. um, because it's my ideal. So I think mm -hmm. that's what people don't want to confront is like, ultimately it's like, it is, there's a little, there's a moral question in there. It's like, are we going to be a society of morals? Uh, and then what are the morals? And are they going to be vulgar notions of freedom? Or are they going to be, or are you going to make a program um, that concretely engages with these issues effectively? And that's what I care about. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, yeah, lots of bullshit. Like even the, I, I saw the, the head of the probation office in LA say, oh, our goal is to have zero juvenile crime. And I was just like, man, fuck you. Yeah, like, it's not a goal. Like, I mean, fuck you in the, in the nicest, yeah, the, the nicest sense. But it's like, they're trying, they're trying to like, they're like, we want to solve juvenile crime, but they just don't have, they just don't know how, how to engage with it or what it means to meaningfully. Um, mm -hmm. It's like, your goal isn't to reduce juvenile crime to zero. It's it's to have a Paul. It's like what do you what do you do when there's a juvenile offender? And it's not going to be ideal because if you have, you know, a juvenile offender like and they you know they kill somebody, they're probably going to go to mm -hmm. you know some form of jail, right? <laughs> so, yeah. um, that this this neoliberal idealism. It's like oh well, we're engaging with freedom because we care more because we we're more willing to say bullshit that doesn't mean mm -hmm. anything like zero juvenile yeah. offenders in Los Angeles. Oh, great. <laughs> like it's like, <laughs> try, it, it, yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah. How are you going to do that? Like you're going to literally like uh, prevent every single child from stepping out of line from the way from school work, you know, so school home. And that's it. Like how are you going to do that to zero? It's, it reminds me of at my last job when my boss, I worked with marketing at the time, and I ask him, what's our like plan? What's our KPI for 
growth of subscribers uh, on, on our social media? Uh, like, what's our goal? And uh, it was a literal question because I had to plan shit, right? And do yeah. some financial stuff, etc. It's like, what's our plan? And he told me 1 million subscribers on YouTube. And I was like... Why not 2 million? First of all, yeah, why not 2 million? And uh, <laughs> I was like, do you understand that? It's, why not 5 it's million? Just, you're just saying numbers at me right now. Like, <laughs> you're just saying numbers. Because I, I said them, well, okay, based on our, uh, like, here is our results on our marketing campaign before. Let's extrapolate that. Give me, please, uh, $20,000, and I will give you that. Like, um, give me $20,000 a month. Yeah. And I can guarantee <laughs> 1 million subscribers. It's like, do we have such a budget? No, we don't. Then why are you saying those numbers at me? <laughs> like, it's just to say the number just to yeah. be big and uh, contradictory because it doesn't really matter anymore what, the problem is it's not what, even wrong to say the number but you have to look at the order the order is okay mm -hmm. so what is your concrete plan what what is the structure to do that and is that reasonable to ask mm -hmm. a bolshevik bistro podcast to get a million subscribers zero no, no 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 it wasn't that it wasn't uh, that it's something else <laughs> It was my job. It was my job completely separate from that. And, oh, okay. Uh, Sorry about that. It was my last <laughs> job. They, we don't have like people pulling strings in Bolshevik Bistro asking. Like, I was going to say, I was like, oh, guys. that's nice. You got like a, it's one of those European podcasts. I know. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes, sometimes yes, like. We have no Europe, relation like, to KGB. We have zero relation to the KGB. Zero. <laughs> no, that's not even what I meant. It's just sometimes like. I think Americans uh -huh. have these like vague ideas and they toss them out <laughs> and then like what sometimes like, 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 like an American sort of YouTube channel might consist of, if you look at, for instance, my YouTube channel, it's like, oh, uh -huh. I have, I have this idea that I'm vaguely going to talk with this person about something. Right. And I've seen like, for instance, the great war channel, which is all about world war one. Mm -hmm. They really have it down to a science, man. And he was in Sweden doing that. And I was just like, wow. I was just really impressed by um by um the whole the whole team at the Great War and how they sort of mm -hmm. put that together. I was like, man, they're really they're really on their on their stuff. Yeah. Well we're not <laughs> yeah, that kind I of feel channel. Like... We are we are like it feels like we're falling apart every other day. Well at least yes. like emotionally it feels <laughs> like I'm going to fall pull apart but we persevere are you considered we persevere a sexual psychotherapist you might have to wait 10 years because i'm the only one currently that i know <laughs> <laughs> um i have two questions left yeah. um uh, my what do you think is going to happen on the debate how is it going to play out what's your prediction it's really interesting that you asked me that and before we were talking about how hegel is isn't a future yeah, but like, yeah, what's it. your personally? Like, are you person uh, like you don't do those sort of extrapolations? I like I like the topic, mm -hmm. and even though the topic is obviously stupid to some extent, the signifiers they used. Um, yeah, but I like the notion. I think I like the notion of. Um, is it better to live under Marxism or capitalism? And I think that's the right debate. Mm -hmm. And, okay. I, and I hope that that is what the debate consists of, because you can yeah. obviously talk about a lot of different stuff. But is it better to live, it, or even specifically, would it be better for the U.S. and Canada, which of Zizek won't do, because why would Zizek be Amer America-centric like that? Yeah. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, it, is it better to live under Marxism or capitalism, and why? And then mm -hmm. getting into identification with consciousness outside of your sort of um, individual mm -hmm. self-knowledge and to know sort of ideas as having their own sort of consciousness and organizing um, reality in a certain way. I, mm -hmm. I think it's a diff it's a very difficult topic. And I hope, um, I can't, I hope it, I, I, would, I would say I hope it doesn't um, denigrate into simply Peterson being like, oh, of course, responsibility and, of course you're right, Slavoy. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and um uh, SGW, I really hope terrible. I really hope I they agree. engage with that contradiction between labor value mm -hmm. and um and use and you know commodity. 
the commodity form yeah. maybe and what it would mean to to rid rid the commodity form and utilize labor value as a mark you know mm -hmm. and i think that would be really interesting so that's what i'm hoping like happens i hope although i, I that's such a difficult conversation to have that i can't have that i can't have a one person version of it it would have to be them like it would have to be peterson the mm -hmm. capitalist versus as uh, zizek the zizek mm -hmm. <laughs> you know i would say the marxist or, yeah 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 or the yeah, Z, zizek fleshing that out and so i'm i i think it 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 has the real possibility of having a real of um being a good conversation but you know what mm -hmm. ready player 1 i was so ready for ready player 1 the movie <laughs> let me just tell you why i was like if because because the technology to make the virtual world is there mm -hmm. um, and i i had the theory that if if demand was manufactured through a good ready player one movie <laughs> mm -hmm. then it would exist then it, would, it ideologically it might manifest but it was so bad <laughs> that, and i read the book the book was very different very good and you know so like the actual form matters and i don't have access to the form but mm -hmm. um i think there's a potential to the form i think okay. I, I and i'm glad i'm glad it's happening i'm glad the peterson zizek debate is 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 happening i think um it's it's about time these two worlds collided and we yeah. saw and we don't know what the uh we don't know what the outcome will be it obviously it neither of them are like heads of state so it won't they won't go back and then rewrite policy um mm -hmm. or whatever but i th i'm just interested i think it's a good thing to take ob object a and object b and throw them in the collider and smash them so that's i don't i happens. in terms of how what's going to happen i don't know mm -hmm. but I, but i know that that's going to happen so my prediction for the debate is that zizek and peterson will talk <laughs> I I would bet my money on that. I agree with yeah. you completely. They would talk. Yeah. My last it's, question before yeah. yeah, yeah, please. It'll be it'll be it'll be interesting and I think it's it's unpredictable. Fundamentally it unpredictable. They could easily what? like what I see in leftist circles, they 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 are very afraid that they will be literally sitting there for half an hour saying how SGW is terrible. And like, <laughs> and then like, people are very afraid that Jezik will be sitting there agreeing with Peterson on a whole bunch of stuff, and then saying something very, very complicated uh, that no one, like, n not uh, normal audience members, won't understand. And uh, yeah. basically, what people are very afraid and very hopeful for, and I think that we can both agree, is well, that well, I can, I can whatever... agree with you that that will either happen or it won't happen. I agree. So the hope that I see, for example, on the leftist Twitter is that everyone hopes that Zizek and Peterson's points would be as different as possible. So that they would be, you know, so that there would be an ultimately like a collision, as you explained, because everybody wants that and they don't want it to be some sort of, you know, puff, you know. So people yeah. want blood, basically. And, I uh, think people I, are engaging with the notions, well. all the notions of how it could go bad. And I think that's, it's like, that's what you sort of are confronted with. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. Zizek and Peterson. And with that is every, it's like, what are the worst ways? How are all the ways it can go bad? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I think some of the ways it will go bad in that sort of way. And um, I think what's, what's going to be worthwhile is that sort of stuff that, you know, to be like sort of Deridian for a second, although it's like there's a capital F future, uh, mm -hmm. which is a future that's unpredictable. So it's like, right. okay, I'm interested in what's going to come out of that collision that we can't yet um, know. And what, what it is specifically is specific content we don't know. We don't know the specific content of the debate. So I, I think... Um, I think I think we might be pleasantly surprised, but of course, me saying that it's like like I say as like a psychotherapist. If my goal <laughs> is to, you know, is to make you is to make you think that you'll be pleasantly surprised, mm -hmm. is like I would then go on to lecture you about how saying so these negative things, you know, they're <laughs> gonna they're gonna happen, and what we have to do is we have to really 
you know, when there's a positive thing, it's like, that's the thing. That's the important thing. You know, here's some new stuff that came out of the Zizek Peterson debate. What you're going to get secondarily is you're going to get, you're going to get all the, you know, oh, it didn't live up to the hype, which of course it won't because it'll be then in the register of the real. So of course it can't live up to the hype. <laughs> and, and so okay. once you see that, once you see a bit of new information that you're like, oh, I like this. I like that they talked about this. That's the real thing. This is bullshit. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so that's me. That's, that's me in there. And you know, if I'm like, if I'm like saying, oh, this is the goal is to make you think that, oh, it won't be disappointing. But then I would say the better goal is, well, what do you, what would, what would be disappointing for you if, uh, in you sort of said that a little bit, I guess. Um, but after what that, what do you, what do you, what would be a disappointing outcome for you? To do it the second time, like a Hegelian. Uh, good question. Um, you know what? I I don't think I will be disappointed with whatever outcome is going to happen. Like because I I don't believe that I I don't believe that the hype in you know in 2019 is that big as for example a year ago. If that would be happen, like if that would happen a year ago. There was so much hype over the, the theoretical debate, right, with Pete Dixon and Zizek, that I would be worried that that would be just underwhelming in terms of content. But in 2019, I personally, I'm uh, the worst thing that could happen is that it wouldn't be live streamed. It won't be available on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> that would be bad. That's the that worst would be thing. Very bad. No, totally. Yeah, because I will have to read about that, you know, and that would be just very inconvenient for me. So that's the only terrible thing that could happen for me personally. Wonderful. I want to watch you, it live. You've been you've been cured of your disappointment by as exactly yes. psychotherapist. Exactly. <laughs> My last question before I yeah. let you go. Um if that could be one thing uh that you would be basically the internet left you know the millennial socialists you know of today uh to do in terms of a psycho uh psychotherapy in terms of psycho uh, psychoanalysis you could say um uh, what would that be if i could teach the left if you could basically left. ask the left collect yeah well if, if you, you could i would love the left to not personalize whatever to the left I would I would mm -hmm. love them to engage with ideas as um, without becoming so reactive in terms of like to be able to have a cordiality to their interactions with each other um, even during disagreements. Mm -hmm. That sounds very basic, but it's lacking currently. I think the left is very yeah. sort of vicious to each other, um, and it's, it's stupid. <laughs> like quite frankly, it's just stupid. Um, you're trying to flesh out I, an idea. So I can't come on Twitter. Going, yeah. I can't yeah. I want to say that I can't come on Twitter without basically seeing that this Sudan group are actually CIA and uh, because I disagree with them uh, like slightly politically. It's it's just awful. Well, for instance, you can even ask them. It's like, "Hey, you're saying this. Are you CIA?" It's like you don't even have to be <laughs> like you don't have to compromise your entire emotional exactly. state. People talk to me and it seemed like they were like Russian, you know, like literally Twitter Russians, like the Democrats yeah, yeah, say. Yeah. I was like, oh, it's the Twitter Russians. And I'm just <laughs> like, oh, it's the Twitter Russians. Hi, Twitter Russians. Um, no, I'm not going to Skype with you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, All right. please don't, and please don't send me a Nazbol. I called them a Nazbol <laughs> or oh, whatever. What is, and they said, what they said oh, Nazbol? you're fantasizing about the Nazbol. Nas uniform we'll 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 uh we'll post mail it to you and i was like okay <laughs> take it take it easy but it was like it was like we can only smuggle anyway the, we can only smuggle our our russia russia chauvinism through gay lube oil so that was their <laughs> that was that was their thing i was like oh god i love the but yeah no cordiality just that. to repeat just yeah to repeat, cordiality cordiality is mm -hmm. achieved when you can t disagree about uh, a topic, even to the point where I would say it becomes like actual, you need to go to war, like mm -hmm. in terms of like a physical war, <laughs> you can, there's no reason you, you can't discuss it and be like, what's your interest? We need this. Well, it's like, well, we really want to take over the U S uh, it's like, Oh, okay. Uh, 
<laughs> and the U.S. is like, well, we kind of just want to take over everything, and you're part of everything. So, yeah, it's like we want to be there, and it's like you don't. Uh, I would say if you if you learned to talk at that level, eventually mm -hmm. those contradictions would have a better chance of sublating into sort of something else. Um, yeah, and I think that's really necessary. Not ne not necessarily when there is like an ideological, there's an unresolvable in terms of one of them is going to win out in some form over the other. But internally yeah. with the left, in terms of like intersectionality, uh, I think Marxists don't fundamentally understand. Um, uh, <laughs> like What, the intersectionality ultimately? The, you know, the, inter the, how it's done. I, the, inis the inescapability of um, mm -hmm. the materiality of, say, being a black person yeah. living in South Central. There's a material ideology um, that if that's you, you're forced to engage with to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, and it, but it is like, you can also separate the economic situation. So, and I think, uh, you know, I've seen Marxists say like, oh, okay, okay, intersectionality, totally unrelated. That's like Doug Lane's position mm -hmm. pretty much. And then, or intersectionality, Marxism is only intersectional. It's like, no, it's the parallax, the parallax. You can mm -hmm. talk about this and then talk about this without one existing and the other going into nothingness. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. They this, can both like, exist. That's a fundamental touching. nature. Yeah. So let, let's yeah. So let's give let's give the left a parallax, the parallax, and cordiality. A, <laughs> parallax and cordiality sounds like a very good answer. Thank yeah. you. Is there anything else you wanted to say before I uh, I will plug your book once again and uh, and we and we turn off this live stream? Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for being able to uh, maintain the time slot that that we had, even though I was I was very I, I just I simply <laughs> insisted my will prevail, <laughs> and, you're, and then it did. So I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> that, we started, I, that we started I know that earlier than later <laughs> yeah yeah if, if i know one thing about psychotherapy, therapy you know, i i very cautious so thank you very much for your okay. you out a bit yeah, yeah we're cutting out a bit but I think we're back. Oh, we're back. I, I said that. I said that. I know that American psychotherapist time slots are rather expensive, so I must. I must be, you know, cautious. I'm sure, yeah, if you if you see me through Medi-Cal, I'm two hundred dollars an hour for Medi-Cal. Oh, really? Not for you. It's free for you uh, if you have Medi-Cal. <laughs> I, I don't have Medi-Cal. I, I have yeah. Belarusian like state <laughs> healthcare. We have a sort of a national healthcare service. I'm not sure if if nice. psychotherapy is included, but I don't know. <laughs> Probably, probably in some form. I would, I, Maybe. I would bet it is. I bet it is. If you looked into it, at some, I, I believe it's something. Yeah, but I that's don't. That's another I, thing. As as uh, someone who works in sort of uh, government funded stuff, it's like look into what your government offers. You know. Yeah. If you need psychotherapy, you need to talk to somebody. Um, mm -hmm. There might be stuff. There might be stuff for you if you. Or yeah. Zizek in the clinic is nice, but um, if you feel. If you feel like you need to talk to someone, uh, use those public resources. We don't have to do everything um, on our own, uh, molecular, molecularized, figuring everything out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there are people around you. Beautiful. But, uh, now, uh, so people, you can get Elliot's book, Jerzyk and Clinic, a revolutionary proposal for a new endgame in psychotherapy on uh, zerobooks.net, uh, which is in the description of this video and audio. Uh, again, Elliot, thank you very much for your time. It was a very uh, interesting discussion. We've covered a lot of ground. We talked about tons of stuff today. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. All right, people. See you later.